Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's session on introducing building survey for retrofit with Professor John Edwards. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to run through just a few housekeeping items. I'm Michael Netter, the professional services officer here at the IHBC. This is part of our new online CPD series. The system we're using today is GoToWebinar. You should be able to see and hear me. You should be able to see John and you should be able to see his slides as well. You should also be able to see a control panel, which has a few important uh, things you want to take note of uh, for this afternoon's session. We'll be doing a series of polls today. So when John comes to the questions uh, in his presentation, he'll read them out and then I will launch a poll uh, where you can respond to that and then we will see everyone's answers. There's also a couple handouts down in the handouts tab. There's a CPD certificate for today. There's also a promotional brochure to our annual school, uh, which will be run again digitally uh, this summer uh, on the 17th and 18th of June. Uh, and finally, uh, for questions, uh, John's going to give about a 45 minute presentation. If you have questions during that presentation, we would ask you to type those into the questions pane and we'll address them in the Q&A session following his presentation. Uh, if you'd rather ask your question live, uh, we would ask you to raise your hand during the Q&A session uh, and we can call on you there uh, and then unmute, you. well, we will allow you to unmute yourself and you can then uh, speak your question. Uh, we do have to wrap up today right at 2 p.m. So we'll address as many questions as we can. Uh, and just to note that we will post the video on our YouTube channel for you to uh, see later if you would like to. Uh, and with that, uh, John, over to you. Thank you, Michael, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to be talking about building survey for Retfit, but of course we haven't got much time to do that and it's a very big subject. So we'll just cover as much as we can in the next 45 minutes, uh, next 45 minutes to an hour. A little bit about me, uh, why am I here today giving this presentation? Well, um, I've been involved with this for quite some time and certainly you can see on the slide that uh, I don't like to say this, but I've been at this for over 40 years and the my first initial professional experience was in surveying buildings and dealing with building pathology and, and the like. And throughout my career, I've been responsible for the retrofit, refurbishment, conservation, repair, of thousands of buildings, many of them may be social housing units, but we're also talking about listed buildings and scheduled monuments as well. And another reason I'm here, I suppose, is because um, I'm also on the panels that produce PAS 2030, PAS 2035 and PAS 2038, which are standards that are going to be or are imposed upon many people at this moment in time. So that's a little bit about me. Now I want to talk about retrofit as a process. The construction manager in me always puts it into a process. And there are three stages we're looking at right now. And which one you start with is up to you. But for me, one, two, and three you see on the screen are the foundations of any retrofit process. So we've got to do those things and we've got to do them properly. And I suppose in many ways, the building survey, which picks up the construction, the materials the building is made of, its condition, you know, that to me is the key part of the process. So we're not going to be looking at any of them in a great deal of detail apart from the ones we're picking on today. So assessment of significance is very important. And condition survey is obviously very important, and we'll look at that in a moment. Now, this particular process is what you see on the IHBC tool, toolkit or toolbox on the IHBC website. It's part of a, um, of a process or guidance note that I produced, and I've based it upon BS7913. So let's look at BS7913 as the backdrop to all of this, and let's look at some of the wise words from BS7913 in this context. So it says that the most effective way of ensuring energy efficiency and sustainability is to keep buildings in good repair so that they last as long as possible, do not need replacement and do not suffer from avoidable decay that would require energy and carbon to rectify. Now, for me, that's just a common sense statement. And it also says that these buildings should provide occupancy in an efficient manner involving minimal production of carbon and use of energy without harming significance or the physical performance of the historic building fabric and finally using natural ventilation and light 
and proper temperature and humidity control for individual rooms are ways of minimizing energy usage that respects the building's material characteristics. Now, for me, this isn't just a common sense approach, it's the holistic approach that we should be taking to all traditional protected and historic buildings. But I would also go as far as say, this is the approach we should be taking to all buildings, but we don't because mainstream advice doesn't take an holistic approach. Some other words from BS 7913 is a really good backdrop Elements such as walls can be over a third less energy efficient if damp. So if you've got a problem in a building that you think it's losing too much energy, what's the first thing you're going to do? Are you going to put insulation on the walls or are you going to be very wise and deal with your moisture problem? Of course, you should be dealing with your moisture problem. And some other fine words, wise words, some energy efficiency measures can have an adverse effect on sustainability. And we'll come back and look at this in a bit more detail later. Now, a building survey will take a long time to do properly. There's a lot to investigate. And what we've highlighted on this screen, are all the different areas you need to think of. If you're surveying a building to retrofit it, and you've got it in your mind, you're only gonna be doing certain things to it. Don't think that way. You've got to think about a whole house approach or a whole building approach. So when it comes to the building survey, you need to survey the whole building. And with experience and with information, and with knowledge, you'll know the areas for you to concentrate on. For example, if you look at the verge, the verge at the area where the verge is located, what if there was moisture penetrating into the walls? Yes, the walls are going to be damp. It means they're not going to be very energy efficient. It also means you can't automatically apply insulation onto those walls. But it also means that you know, the, the ridge board or the purlin, the timber purlin bearing into that wall could also be in a state whereby it could rot and fail. So you've got to understand that. Lead work in terms of gutters and valleys, they're always areas which are prone to problems. Now, it's, they, are very, they are areas where it's not going to be so easy either to gain access unless you've got a pole camera, you've got a drone, or you've got a ladder. And, you know, it's not always possible to view those areas in a great deal of detail. So what you have to do is go into the roof space, look to the underside side of those locations, you know, look with your eyes, look with your moisture meter, see if any problems exist. Flashings. They are some of the biggest problems in older buildings, in all buildings, I should say, not just older ones. They are the areas where I always find a risk of failure. If I can get it very close, I'll just touch those flashings, just give them a little bit of a pull, and very often they will come out of the wall. But I suppose we often have not got the chance to visualize them so closely and to be able to touch them and feel them. But when we go into the roof space, that's one of the areas I always target. The abutments, the roof has to a structure such as a chimney stack because that is also an area where we can examine the inside and see if there's any moisture problems. Chimney pots and flaunching, out of sight, out of mind, you could say yeah maybe a st structural problem if the pot is not secure to the top of the chimney stack but there are also areas where moisture can penetrate through the chimney stack and into the core of the building again causing a problem. And then if we look at solid walls, well, what can we say about solid walls? Loads and loads of things we can say about solid walls. But think about penetrating moisture coming through the walls. Think about penetrating moisture, you know, affecting the ends of timber joists. Think about walls which have been badly treated with cement render on the outside, stopping any evaporation of moisture, therefore putting at risk, at increased risk, any timber bearing into the wall. And think about other things as well. Think about cavity walls. Very often, an older building may have an extension on the building somewhere, which has got cavity wall construction. They are very often the most shoddily built parts of the building, the newer bits, in my experience anyway. And in my experience, many cavity walls are not built properly. You get mortar droppings, congregate into the bottom, therefore bridging any damp roof courses present. So they are things to be explored as well. Along with damp roof courses generally, how do damp roof courses fail? They don't really fail. They could be compromised with, with, uh, with the, the, the ground on the outside of the building being built up against the building, therefore bridging it. And then we've got damp roof membranes. How do you know you've got a damp roof membrane? What sort of age is the building? So all of these things are the areas we need to target, as well as these areas here. Floor joists bearing into walls, 
How do we know if there's a problem? Well, if we look at the air bricks around the building and they're blocked or you can't find them because the ground has been raised, you can, you can really be assured that there might be a problem with your timber floor where there's not enough ventilation in the subfloor area to help it erupt. So these are also some of the areas we should be concentrating on, as well as drainage, which could mean water, water overflowing into the building, causing moisture problems. Down pipes, soil and vent pipes. If they're leaking, they'll cause moisture problems in the building fabric, making it less energy efficient. But it also means we can't automatically apply solid wall insulation on those areas of walling if they have high moisture content. And of course, we have flat roofs, very much uh, areas which are prone to moisture problems. And I guess you're thinking already that um, a lot of the problems I've been talking about are to do with moisture. And yes, because around 80% as a rule of thumb, around 80% of all problems in buildings are to do with moisture. So if you're building surveying, if you're carrying out a survey on a building in terms of a part of a retrofit process, you must have a firm eye on moisture problems because that's the sort of problem you're going to get. That's the sort of problem you could make worse if you do the wrong thing to the building. If you're going to carry out a building survey, you need to be well equipped. You need to be equipped with a good computer, you need to be equipped with good equipment, and you need out to know how to use that equipment if you are to do a proper building survey. You need expertise. Many surveyors might be very good at modern buildings, do they always know the difference between an older building and a modern building? Do people generally in the construction industry know the difference? Most of them don't, otherwise they wouldn't continue to treat traditional buildings as if they are modern. So we've got to know the key differences. For example, if you look at the building on the right-hand side with solid vapor permeable masonry walls, very thick walls, typically, but not always, and when it rains on the outside, moisture will ingress into the building fabric, and when the rain stops and the sun comes out, most of that moisture will evaporate by the external face of the wall. But to some degree, in a fairly minor and equal way, some moisture may, may evaporate by the internal face of the enclosing walls or through the floors in a very minor way. I'm talking about vapor here, not liquid. And any moisture that does accumulate within the internal spaces will disperse into the atmosphere through natural ventilation because we have open chimney flues, windows that don't quite fit and the like. And this is the way traditional buildings have been performing for many hundreds, if not more years. And if we compare that with the modern building of today, relying upon air gaps, cavities, vapor barriers in the external building envelope to keep the moisture out, and at least in some spaces relying upon mechanical ventilation to remove moisture that does accumulate, we can see that these buildings are different. They've got different design, they've got different materials, they're put together differently, they are performing differently, and that definitely needs to be understood if we're carrying out a survey as part of a retrofit process. We need to understand where the building is located. That has a huge bearing on the performance of the building and what we can do to the building. Now, if it wasn't for these pandemic times, I may be in London delivering a webinar, not a webinar, a seminar in London, Exposure Zone 1. Now, my university is in South Wales in Swansea. It's only 200 miles from London, but Swansea receives four times as much rainfall on an annual basis compared to London. And that tells you the stark difference in these different weather exposure zones. So that needs to be understood. And we must understand the environment generally around the building, generally around the building, you know, surface water, is it running to the building or away from the building? Are trees, are the roots of trees damaging the foundations or are they providing shelter to the building? Wind is great, it helps to dry out the building fabric, but heavy wind driven rain is not so good, is it? So all these issues and other issues need to be understood properly as part of that building survey. We need to record data. We need to use the data. So we record data, as you can see on the screen, on the outside of the building, and we record the same or similar data on the inside of the building. And we do that for a number of reasons. First of all, the inside is going to relate to what's happening on the outside. And there's a huge difference in terms of the environment conditions externally in July compared to January. But we need to look at that finer detail. For example, very briefly, if we look at the absolute humidity levels, compare them on the outside to the inside, we can see there's quite a difference there. We've got to use that data. We've got to analyze that data. So the first question we would ask in that situation, why is the absolute humidity so much greater internally? 
Is it due to the use of the building? Is there a lot of moisture being produced for the use? Is it due to the fact that the building fabric is heavily moisture laden because there's all sorts of problems with the building fabric? Is it due to a lack of ventilation? All these questions and more need to be asked and we need to find out the answers to all these particular issues. Indeed, we must. Relative humidity levels, if they're too high or too low, there's a problem. So we need to use a hygrometer and record these relative humidity levels. And when it comes to the post-occupancy evaluation, which I'll talk about later, it's so important that we've recorded all this data at this stage, because then we've got something to, re to re compare the data we're recording at a later date. So we must record this data. So when we look, when we're analysing the building, looking at the use of the building, we'll observe all the things which are going on inside the building, all the things with the occupants are doing inside the building, and noting the sort of moisture that could be produced from all these various different activities. We can relate it to tables like this, which indicates to us how much moisture is on average being produced by doing certain things. So the first one there, people, we all produce moisture, no matter what we do, if we just sit there, breathe, sweat, we are producing moisture. And there's a huge difference between four people living in a, in a small flat to compare to one person living in a, in a flat and all the various different activities we might do and not do. There is no such thing as the average person, is there? So all this needs to be assessed. When we're doing this building survey, we should also be finding out what other measures have been installed in the building and how adequate those measures are and what they mean to the condition of the building and the use of the building. So if we look at this traditional building here, it has external wall insulation applied. Fortunately, the roof has been extended over the top of that insulation, which is fantastic, isn't it? But if you look at the towards the uh, you know the ground level there, you will see there's quite a bit of staining on that external wall insulation, so maybe it's too close to the ground. But I want to look at something else. This is a section through the wall of that building, and as you can see here, look at it very carefully because I'm going to ask you a question in a moment. Uh, you can see the external wall insulation being applied. Look at its configuration. Look at the way it's being applied. Look at where it's located. And also look at the loft insulation and look at where that is located and look at the uh, the relationship between the external wall insulation and the in and the loft insulation and you need to ask yourselves are there any problems okay think about this now are there any problems and i've there's three answers to these there's three possible answers no there isn't a problem yes there is a problem it's a thermal by it's thermal bypass or three it's a thermal bridge so I would like you to think about what is the most likely problem? There are maybe other problems as well, which I haven't noted, but what is the most likely and obvious problem? So uh, Michael, if you want to get the quiz going and people can think about the answer to this now, think about what the answer is. And in a moment, you'll get the opportunity, you'll get the opportunity I'm not too sure where the questions have come up, Michael. Yep, the responses are still coming in. I'm just going to give it a few more seconds. Yep. All right. All right, and there's your response, right, John? Okay, I can't see the response. I think maybe I will have to. All oh, right, uh, okay. Well, it's 0% uh, said no, 43% said yes, it's a thermal bypass, and 57% said yes, it's a thermal bridge. Right, okay. Well, I would say, I would say, well, put it this way when I looked at this building, I think the hobby of the household must have been painting and decorating because I could always smell fresh paint. Maybe it's because I was coming along, I doubt it. But I couldn't see any problems when I just took a photograph of this. But if you look at my, if you look at my thermal image, you can see then, yes, those of you who thought there might be a thermal bridge, yes, there is a thermal bridge because there is a gap between the external wall insulation and the loft insulation. And I'm showing this now with the purple line, which relates to the purple part of the image you can see in the top right hand corner and yes I would say the most obvious problem there is a thermal bridge 
So well done on those who got that correct. Now, uh, another example of the sort of thing we need to be looking at when we're looking at whether uh, uh, retrofit measures have already been installed into a building. So this is a, this is a solid masonry wall. You have a timber bearing into the wall. You have a floor above, a ceiling below, and we do have an inevitable thermal bridge. But because it's a vapor permeable wall, any moisture does accumulate within the building fabric because of that thermal bridge will just evaporate outwards, not a problem. We'll have a situation, if we do have a situation, when you do the building survey, you do observe that there is internal wall insulation applied, then you will understand, or you should understand, that that would give rise to a strong thermal bridge, strong thermal bridge. So it's increasing the risk of any timber, you know, the timber joists of going rotten at the end. It's increasing the risk. The question is, the people doing the building survey, do they realize that that problem could now exist? Now, if they do, they may want to explore to see if there's any insulation that's been installed in the floor ceiling void. Because if it has been installed, then we may come back then to a situation where it's an inevitable thermal bridge and not such a problem. So the thing is, people doing the building surveys need to know how to determine whether existing measures have been installed how, and whether they've been installed properly. And also understand what their analysis means in reality. Now, like I said, like I've shown you before, some energy efficiency measures can have an adverse effect on sustainability. And we could talk an awful lot more about that, but we simply haven't got the time. Now, a building survey, you know, bearing in mind a lot rides on this building survey. Just think about, it. we may be spending thousands of pounds following this building survey in making the building more energy efficient. So the building survey has to be a good survey. We have to rely upon it. And the quality of the outcome of the building survey is determined by the type of building survey. Is it a purely visual glance around the building or is it a proper building pathological analysis? It'll be determined by the competency of the surveyor, you know, whether that's a professionally qualified surveyor, whether that person or surveyor is a conservation accredited or certified. And also the quality of the survey, the quality of the outcome of the survey is also, also determined by the equipment used. Is it with somebody with next to no equipment or with a two pin resi moisture resistance meter, or is it with a full kit of equipment that I showed you a picture of a few moments ago? So all of this determines the quality of the outcome of the survey. So that's the condition survey. And the condition survey, in terms of its output, it will give us information on what we need to do to the building to put it into a good enough shape in order that it's ready for retrofit, but it can also tell us what works we can do to the existing building to make it more energy efficient in itself without even thinking about retrofit measures. That's what it can do. And then we've got the energy performance assessment producing the EPC. And then we come to number four. You can see what number four is. Let's see what that's all about. So in number four, we will check the accuracy of the EPC and we'll check its recommendations. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment with the case study I'm showing you in front of you. We'll assess the recommendations to the building survey. We'll do that as well. And number three, we'll evaluate the mix of works and measures. Now we can evaluate the mix of measures through the STBA guidance wheel, but bearing in mind, you have to be able to do a building survey first in order to answer all the questions such as what condition is it in? And bearing in mind, it's only about retrofit measures inside that wheel, but it's an excellent piece of equipment. I don't know why no more, you know, people don't know more about it. And, but we have to evaluate those measures with a mix of works as well, because work to the building fabric can also make it more energy efficient. So we'll, we'll get the EPC, we'll scrutinize the EPC as we did with this particular property here. Uh, we look at the EPC and we'll look, oh, it's not very good at the moment. This is only a band G. But if we did all those works, if we did all those works which are recommended, wow, we'll, we'll reach a band A. But what we have to do is look at see whether there's any mistakes made in this EPC uh, and also determine that, you know, whether the recommendations being made in the EPC are possible, sensible, feasible, you know, whether they're a good thing to do or not. So. Um, so this is the sort of narrative I would produce in my report. So undertaking the installation of energy efficiency retrofit measures on an ad hoc basis, on that retrofit measure basis is fraught with risks 
to the building itself and to its occupation. And why do we say that? Because when you look at the EPC, that's what it's telling you to do. And then we say that the installation of a single measure can have an impact on other elements of the building. And therefore, a whole house approach should be undertaken, which means taking a well-informed, planned approach, an approach utilising an appropriate expert using the STBA online guidance wheel as recommended. So that's what I recommend to my clients. What else do I say? I also say consideration should be given to appointing an installer accredited with Trustmark working to PAS 2035. Now, PAS 2035 isn't brilliant. Trustmark isn't brilliant, but we would be a lot worse off without them. So that's what I recommend. And what else do I recommend? I say one important general point to note is that the method by which the EPC is produced, RDSAP, is not particularly accurate, especially where traditional, traditionally constructed buildings are concerned. This is because of the standardized nature of the, of the information within the software in terms of construction and building usage. However, it can provide a starting point in the development of proposals for improvements in the energy performance of the building. Nevertheless, energy efficiency improvements should always commence with putting the building fabric into good condition, including the use of appropriate and compatible materials. We've only got time to look at one of the measures that have been recommended in this example of work, and it's recommendation two, internal or external wall insulation. Bearing in mind, this is a traditional building. It says that, well, this is what I say, the recommendation for external or internal solid wall insulation needs to be approached with caution. Both internal and external solid wall insulation have advantages and disadvantages. Generally speaking, external wall insulation carries less technical risk, but has a negative impact on the external appearance. Internal wall insulation carries greater technical risks, but doesn't have an impact, but does but doesn't have an impact on the exterior appearance. Also, solid wall insulation needs to be carefully designed and properly interact with other energy efficiency measures and with the building itself. This will ensure that risks are managed, but it must be understood that it is impossible to remove all risks. One very important point is that the insulation material should be a permeable kind, just like the original building fabric, but other works will also be necessary to reinstate the permeable characteristics of the existing building fabric, such as uh, you know, removing all those things there. And we say that if wall insulation is being installed, then it must be ensured that the roof extends over the insulation to provide adequate protection and that the insulation is brought into the ground in order to reduce thermal bridging at the base of the wall. There's a lot more to be said about that, but we haven't got time today. So we're also talking about the general building fabric in a general sense. So we're talking about removing external cement-based mortar pointing and replacing with lime, removing all impermeable paint, and if there are any in, uh, cement-based internal plaster systems, they should be replaced with lime as well. And we talk about those issues. So in many buildings we come across, they would have been, if you like, treated as if they are modern. And therefore we need to remove all those modern impermeable ele elements before we do that retrofit process. And I should also mention this. <clears throat> we cannot determine what level or standard of retrofit we can install without understanding the building first and without going through this particular process. You could say, if you know the typology of the building, you could say there's a fair old chance of doing your major retrofit or deep retrofit. But to be perfectly honest, I don't believe you can do that safely without understanding the building first. And also say it's a very dangerous approach to say fabric first all the time, because we should not be taking a fabric first approach. We should be taking a risk-based approach. And once we understand all the risks and, you know, then there's a fine margin between whether we do work to, to the fabric or to do new technologies, etc., then maybe we would be doing retrofit first, sorry, fabric first. But that's not the initial approach we should be taking. We should be taking a risk-based approach, which is what PAS 2035 says for traditional buildings. So we've, we've completed that process number four. Then we do a cost-benefit analysis. Then we, will, then we will test our proposals and measure the impact that our proposals have on the significance of the building. Now that to me is also a very important part of the process. 
And now I have another question for you. The question is, and I'm asking this question because only this week somebody who's very well informed uh, emailed me about they're concerned about something they'd seen or heard, uh, which suggests that maybe we're not always analysing significance when we're recommending um, the retrofitting of traditional buildings. So the question for all of you is, think about this now, should all technical guidance in all technical guidance for historic buildings and traditional buildings now, should all technical guidance include, in, include the need for heritage impact assessments? So the question is, that's the question. The answer is either yes or no. So Michael, if you want to uh, put the wheels into motion so people can have a go at answering that question as well. And I'd be particularly interested in hearing the, the answer to that one. All right, so we'll give it a few more seconds. Just a few more votes coming in here. All right, let's close it and share it. And John, if you can't see the answer still, I'll read out that 6% have said no and 94% have said yes. Okay, well, I'm listening to you because in the IHBC process, that's what we've inserted into it, a heritage impact assessment. But it's sad, I think, it is sad for the older traditional buildings, which I do feel sorry for on many occasions when I see the way they've been treated. It's unfortunate a lot of guidance out there doesn't say that, and it should. So I'm pleased that you, the audience here today, agree with me that it should include the need for heritage impact assessment. So thank you for that. So then we come to number seven. We need to finalize our proposals, uh, design the work, specify the work and the measures. And after number seven, we can come to number eight, where we'll see the work implemented. And bearing in mind all the other things I'm saying there, there should be a proper process in terms of quality control, audits, inspection and test plans, which I haven't got time to talk about today, but they're all part of that installation process. And then we got number nine, which is the audit. We carry out an audit and we carry out a post-occupancy evaluation. I haven't got time to talk about the audit, but I will talk about the post-occupancy evaluation because that is critically important. And I hope you can see from this why it, why it is so intrinsically important that we do a proper building survey and proper analysis of the building before we do anything to it at all. So I'm highlighting one of the slides I showed earlier using all the correct equipment, all the right sort of expertise, taking all the data and recording all that data right at the very beginning before the work is undertaken. We'll go through that process all over again once we've completed the project. Once we completed all the works and all the measures, all the retrofit measures, we'll do that again. And when we're recording that data, we can record the data on completion compared to the data we recorded before the work was implemented. And hopefully we've seen some improvements. Hopefully we have. And then when the building is into use, it could be a short while into use, and I would say a year or so after use, when the building fabric has had a chance to dry it properly, then we'll do that analysis all over again. But unless we take the data at all these various different stages, how do we know whether we've made any improvements or not? If we do not know what sort of relative immunity levels we have before we do the work, if they're seen as high when we got the building in use after all those works have been undertaken, do we know that the cause of any perhaps apparent high relative immunity levels are due to the works that have been undertaken or not? Unless we got the data at the beginning, we don't know what the reasons are for say high relative immunity levels, but hopefully we've made a big improvement to the building. So this post-occupancy evaluation will evaluate the condition of the building. It will evaluate the environmental conditions inside the building. And of course, we also need to look at fuel bills as well and see what effect that that has had on the, um, uh, uh, the use of fuel has had in terms of the retrofit and other energy efficiency work. So the post-occupancy evaluation is very important, but it's important to do it properly. Now, this is the UK mainstream guidance for homes in the UK that receives public finance in terms of their retrofitting. 
Um, and I would say all homes, whether they're new, modern, high rise flats or little terrace traditional houses. It covers all of them. It also covers listed buildings and buildings in conservation areas. It covers the whole lot. Now, past 2035, there are some good bits in past 2035, but it's largely a process, okay? And as part of that process, we have the installation stage. Well, where the installation stage is concerned, it refers to past 2030. Now, I would say, whereas the process I've been describing to you, which is based upon BS7913, is an holistic approach because it doesn't just involve retrofit measures, it involves works we should be doing to the building as well. Past 2035 and past 2030 are different because it's only about retrofit. They do include works that you should be undertaking, you know, uh, to bring the building into good repair. It does state that. But as part of the overall process, it only includes retrofit measures. In many areas, it's not as robust as the process I've just been showing you. For example, in the building survey, it doesn't include the need, for example, to take relative humidity levels. And therefore, in the post-occupancy evaluation, it's a questionnaire, largely, and a brief inspection. I could go into more detail, but we haven't got time. So it is different. But let's stick with the building survey part of it, just for your own awareness that the person undertaking the building survey is the retrofit assessor. Now, the retrofit assessor is responsible for a number of different things. Yes, the retrofit assessor is responsible for the building survey. That person is responsible for assessing the EPC and doing all the things I talked about, seeing that whether it's accurate, sensible, accurate, you know, and all the rest of it. And also looking at the measures which have already been installed, understanding them, and also looking to see whether the retrofit measures being recommended are sensible as well. And it also includes an occupancy assessment in a roundabout the way I described you as well. But in addition, the retrofit assessor also has to do the significance assessment. Now, if it's the building has special protection, um, it may, if it's in a building, a conservation area, a listed building, then a full a significance assessment should be undertaken in line exactly with what PAS 20, no, in line exactly what BS7913 says. If it isn't a protected building, which means 90% of all traditional buildings do not have any special protection, then it's a basically a tick box exercise. So that's the responsibility for the retrofit assessor. So when we talk about building survey for retrofit, that's primarily, and it's a little bit more complicated than this, but we haven't got time to look into, into any more detail than this. Uh, primarily, it's the retrofit assessor's role to do that building survey. Now, if we look at who the retrofit assessor is, now the retrofit assessor, the, um, on most occasions, there are some caveats involved in this, but not many. Uh, but the retrofit assessor is an accredited and qualified domestic energy assessor. So it's normally somebody who's done about five days of training, has done five EPCs, which are assessed. They have to pass uh, an exam as well. So they, they are then a domestic energy assessor, which are qualified and accredited under one of the accreditation schemes, which includes uh, Elmhurst, Stroma, QDOS, they're the main ones. Um, and then those accreditation bodies will train up the domestic energy assessors for about two days of training, uh, whereby uh, they will have an end test at the end. And then if the accreditation body thinks they're good enough, then they would be accredited as retrofit assessors. That's what, the, the, that's what a retrofit assessor is. That's the person who does the building survey. Now, if the building they are dealing with is a traditional and a protected building, or any protected building, um, then they also have to do the course, which is mentioned at the top of this slide, which is a two-day course, which achieves a level three award qualification in the energy efficiency and retrofit of traditional buildings. But if the building, if the traditional building doesn't have uh, any special protection, then the retrofit assessor does not have to have that qualification, but I think that's likely to change, very, very likely to change by the end of this year. Now, I only wanted to focus on the uh, retrofit uh, assessor, but as we, get, we seem to be running ahead of time a little bit, I mentioned something else as well, because some of you might be very interested in the retrofit designer. Now, the retrofit designer doesn't need to do any additional qualifications or courses like the thing I've just mentioned here right now, but they do have to be conservation accredited or certified if they are 
undertaking retrofit design work in terms of traditional buildings. And there's a lot more to be said about that as well and the qualification I've just mentioned. And if you want to know any more about that, then I suggest you go to the environmentstudycenter.org or ask me a question in the Q&A session. Now I've got a question for you. Now I've got a question for you. Um, so today, on where traditional buildings are concerned, do you think that most people have sufficient energy efficiency and respite knowledge, or do they need to know more? Now I'd just be very interested uh, to understand what people's perceptions are. Um, so if you if you look at that question, think of the answer, and Michael has probably already beaten me to it and put the, the question onto the screen so that you can tell us what you think about that particular question and tell us what, in your view, is the answer. Yep, that's right, John. Questions up and uh, questions are coming in or answers are coming in. It looks like we're about there. So uh, I'm going to close it now and share it. All right. Well, you'd be happy to hear that 100% of the audience thinks they need to know more. Well, you're a great audience. But you know what? If you were just the mainstream audience and you were not from the heritage sector, my guess is the answer would be completely different because many people who are working under mainstream retrofit um, do not feel the need for additional training and qualifications in traditional buildings. They're treating them as if they are modern. And that's, you know, and that's a very sad story for traditional buildings, but that's where we are right now. But when we're looking at past 2035, it doesn't tell them to get those qualifications very often, but there's more to be said about that, which I haven't got time to cover today. So thank you for that one. So finally, um, if you if you want to do um, if you you know, you're not getting much out of today, 45 minutes isn't the law of knowledge on this particular subject matter. Seeing it is such a big subject matter, but if you if you do want to um, do the two day course that achieves this qualification, then you know what to do. It's on the screen. Or if you know people that should be getting this qualification and are getting and do and need to get additional um knowledge on this area then then let them know about it it comes highly recommended i would recommend it to you but i would say that because i'd actually deliver that course uh, but many people have done it i think um we've had people from all the main heritage bodies around the uk except cadu i think but certainly we've had lots and are and lots from historic environment scotland historic england the northern ireland um, heritage agency um english heritage National Trust have had loads of people do this course, but also thankfully um, many conservation officers, we've delivered the course in-house to uh, organisations such as Westminster City Council to their conservation and planning officers. And, um, but thankfully also many people in the retrofit sector as well, many retrofit coordinators have done it, not compared to the number of retrofit coordinators out there, many retrofit assessors have, have also done it but not many compared to those who need to do it. So uh, across the board, we've had lots of people, but um, uh, it's good to see. And and I must admit, for those people from mainstream, it's a revelation. They may not use that word themselves, but I often get told I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm talking about buildings from a traditional building perspective. Whereas if you don't know anything about traditional buildings and all your training has been on modern buildings, you look at things differently. And many people like that do. And they think that because I'm saying something different to what they've been taught in other courses, that I must be wrong. But of course, where traditional buildings are concerned, I'm not. <laughs>